It is. It, it's a disease, same as an alcoholic. He's got to have his booze. Well, the white bait is no different. He's just got to come down. I've never missed a, a, an opening day for years. Even if I know there's nothing, I've got to come down on that opening day to see. Welcome to Morco, the white bait capital of the North Island. During the season, which runs from mid-August until the end of November, whitebait make their way upstream from the sea, swimming near the river's edge. Nets are set and big catches of whitebait are taken from the lower reaches of the Morco River. In Morco's roadside Whitebait Inn, a series of photos show some of the ingenious arrangements whitebaiters have for setting and retrieving their nets. In New Zealand, the term whitebait describes the juvenile forms, around 4 to 5 centimetres long, of five different edible species of native freshwater fish. A popular delicacy, whitebait is often dropped into batter, which is fried to make whitebait fritters. In most towns where whitebait is caught, locals tell tales of massive catches in the past. While some of these stories may be fables, the whitebait catch is definitely much smaller than it used to be as many of the spawning grounds of whitebait have been destroyed and the quality of river water has declined because of runoff from agriculture and other land use. In early times, Māori caught whitebait using nets and other devices. European settlers copied this practice and their early journals refer to masses of whitebait swimming upstream, causing the water to darken. Old timers talk of cartloads of whitebait being caught, with the excess used as garden manure or fed to poultry until their eggs had a fishy taste. The Morco River is a natural boundary and in earlier times divided the Māori tribes of Taranaki from the Tainui tribes in the Waikato. Because of this, land was often in dispute, so Morco became the scene of many battles. The surrounding hills still show the signs of many pa or fortified villages. During the early 19th century, a group of women, children and old people from the Ngati Toa tribe migrated south from Kafia Harbour. They were protected by a small number of warriors. At Morco, they found themselves delayed by the full tide. It flooded the estuary, making it impossible for the group to cross. To create the illusion that they had many more warriors and therefore deter the pursuing Waikato warriors from attacking them, the Ngati Toa group dressed some of the women as chiefs. They also spread cloaks over bushes, lit numerous campfires and recited rousing warlike rhetoric far into the night. It worked. Rather than attack straight away, the pursuers waited for reinforcements allowing the Ngati Toa group to cross the river to safety when the tide dropped and eventually reach their final destination of Kāpiti. Their migration became known as Te Heke Tahu Tahu Ahi, the migrants who lit fires. After the 1840 Treaty of Waitangi, Moko was settled by Europeans. The river became a vital route into the Waikato region where sawmilling, then farming and mining gradually replaced the bush with pasture. Nevertheless, large pockets of forest remained and the Morco River became a tourist attraction, offering visitors river cruises far inland. In 1907, the Tourist and Health Resorts Department's journalist, James Cowan, visited Morco and described it as the most beautiful place in New Zealand. Today, several cruise boats still ply the river, but most people and goods arrive in the town via the coastal highway. As visitors pass through Morco, they may notice a curious spherical monument on the roadside. This is a German mine found washed up in 1942, evidence that German craft were able to get very close to the New Zealand coastline during World War II. The mine bears the brief description, in times of peace, without vigilance, the people perish. <laughs>